sort of the highlights, at least from our perspective, of uh, things that happened over uh, over the last year, uh, sort of connected to this uh, to this hack night. Uh, before we do that, uh, the sort of the, the best part about this is the poll. And so to sort of make sure that everybody knows each other, we kind of just go around the room, everyone just sort of introduce themselves, and sort of maybe like one sentence on why you're here, what you're interested in. Uh, so I'll start. I'm Derek Eater. Uh, I make things with Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Reverend Jimmy, um, A plus certified computer technician. Um, <laughs> God bless you all. Too sharp. I'm Jeff Hall. 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 I'm
Michael Holloway. I'm an attorney. I work for the Institute for Science, Law, and Technology at Chicago Penn Law School, and I'm just going to check it out the first time. Hi, I'm Julie Burroughs at the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. I am developing data sets that relate to arts and culture. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a developer from BellWorks. Just looking to get involved. My name is Molly. I'm a developer from BellWorks as well. Uh, I'm just kind of trying to figure out what the project is starting. I'm Jeremy Conway, I work at Jellyvision. I'm a front end developer, just looking to see what kind of projects I can help out on. My name is Brian, I work for Forward US, trying to get immigration reform passed, and I came here once a couple weeks ago, and I just kept on coming because it's very interesting. So, this is my third time here. Hi, I'm Angela. Um, I do a little bit of everything, and I'm actually kind of so searching. <laughs> How's it going? I'm Peter. I work for a company called Brutalit, and we own an open source uh, payment solution. How's it going, guys? I'm Alex. I work in the communication strategy. Uh, here. Oh. Hey, I'm Megan. I'm a software engineer at Insurance person and a copywriter on the side. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Raleigh. I'm a Rails developer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is David. I'm a student and a Rails developer. How's it going, Joshua Chesney, Rails developer? Uh, my name is Kevin. I used to work on um, some of these projects in the city. I'm now in the private sector, but I'm working on a, uh, a program to build a social service database in California and then create all sorts of interesting things on top of it. My name is Ari. I'm a, a tech consultant in nonprofits for Kansas on Tech Chicago, and my name is Care Learn. Hi, I'm Alyssa. I'm a law student at the University of Chicago, and uh, I work for the Garmin staff, planning on going into public service in the future, so I'm just here to learn. It's my first time. Uh, my name's Joel, I'm an architect at Skid Mornings in Ireland. I'm a professor in architecture at IoT. I just saw in urban simulation and urban model. Hi, I'm Andrew Tomka, and I came to one of these meetings at the very start of the year. And when I saw the year in review, I was like, oh, I'm there. You <laughs> guys did a lot of great stuff at the beginning of the year. I am interested in and working on public and open uh, Wi Fi networks. So if anybody's doing any of that, let me know. Uh, I'm Nick. I'm a software engineer with Civis Analytics. And I've done Civic hacking in the past and sort of like re entering that space. Hi, I'm David Leal. I work at the SAP DR Control the whole time, but I'm also doing a master's degree in predictive analytics at the call, so I'm just kind of working on this. I'm Scott. I'm a software developer here, 1871, dabbling in uh, startups. Uh, my name is Ed. I work for the Chicago Park District. I'm an IT manager, and I'm managing our uh, open data project in 2014. Interested in Hi, I'm Linda. I do business strategy, and I'm working on a project that's actually mapping historical sites around Chicago. So I would like to speak to you, <laughs> and uh, also working on a recycling uh, mapping app for Chicago. <coughs> I'm Eric Benzanto. Uh, Josh Kalov, GIS Data Analyst. Um, and there's six open seats over here. You know, stand yeah. Yeah. Come sit down. Hi, I'm Kristen Zelinka. I'm an artist and designer working on interactive gaming initiatives. Hi, I'm Kurt. I'm a software developer. Um, I'm Lynn. I teach math to high school students. <coughs> And potentially, I'm going to make them learn how to program. <laughs> if anyone has any suggestions about how to teach 15 year olds how to learn programming, let me know. Uh, my name is Monta Sisson Abitus. I'm a software engineer downtown. Uh, data enthusiast. It's my first time here. I'm interested in what you guys are doing. Matthew Shackstead. I'm with Skidmore Owens and Merrill, building urban planning and design tools. My name is Gustavo. I'm a PhD student in public administration at UIC. My name is Nina Sample. I really wanted to do um, 
data journalism and civic hacking even before my newspaper folded in six months of work. And I started, I started coming here when that happened, and I met the people I'm working with now at my very second hack night. And we just rolled out a, a data project. And my, uh, since the end of the year, I wanted to share this. My uh, New Year's resolution is to start working in here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ala. I'm a game designer. I'm with uh, Freedom Games. And we're working on um, innovating in the um, citizen scientist space for kids between third and eighth grade. Hey, I'm Eve Tolbert. I'm a former teacher and program developer. And thank you, Freedom Games, on that situation. I'm Will. I'm an IP consultant. And uh, we've been on the same project. Uh, my name is Michael Frasco. I'm an undergraduate statistics and sociology major at the University of Chicago. Hello, my name is Randy Baxley, and I'm a pointer and uh, catalyst for a project that I call uh, Visual CTA Chicago. My name is Nick Bennett. I'm a programmer. Um, I'm interested in helping others get into programming, get over the hump. Like I can help you with Git. We have to help anyone else with Git or Python or whatever else I know. And my name is uh, Chris Whitaker. I am a project manager for the Smart Chicago Collaborative and the Code for America Brigade Captain for Chicago. And I teach Civic Hacking 101. Mm -hmm. what do you Civic Hacking 101? Yeah. Well, we'll get to that at the end. But uh, uh, and that's also just camera, uh, which we uh, we broadcast these and record them so that people who can't make it to these things uh, can see what's going on. Uh, cool. So, oh yes, question. Actually, can I redo my intro? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid of what this blows, but okay. <laughs> I actually do have a startup called TropicSpaces.com. It's like Airbnb for retail. We're really interested in um, knowing how to make. Um, well, we have a lot of really friends, and I'm very interested in knowing how to make commercial real estate more profitable for all the friends who are trying to do pop-up shops. So um, I'm actually specifically in town to try to help Mexico tourists work to a pop-up. So if you guys get any promos promoting tourism to Mexico, yeah. <laughs> uh, out of curiosity, why did you decide to change your intro? Uh, you heard it like all the people in this room. It's an interesting thing that I feel like you should put it out there. Okay. And I'm, I'm really interested in working more with the CTA. Chicago Transportation House, already bought top Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyways. All right. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so, going into the presentation, which will be by myself and Christopher, uh, we have a sort of an open uh, 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 section of the evening for announcements. Uh, so, uh, projects that you're working on or events you want to uh, share with the rest of the group. Uh, so, we'll open that up. Yeah. All right. Uh, I would like to start. Oh, yeah, okay. Do you want to, can you give us a URL to show it? Or do yeah, you? yeah. Okay. Um, uh, do I have to visit the website? Uh, give it 100.com forward slash. Uh, at so that. Give it 100. Not give oh. Give it 100. <laughs> give it 100. <laughs> uh, at Jesus is God. Ah, yes. Okay. For those of you who've been here last year, you or last week, you. Uh, at, you have to yeah. show that between. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I just, yeah, at Jesus is God. Uh -huh. There you go. Come on, Chris. You can do it. <laughs> I think we saw this last week, right? All right, everybody, yes. I am a game developer, T Shop X and A Hardcore. This is a website where a lady was like, I'm going to dance for a year, for a whole year, and I'm going to be dope at the end. Then she started her own startup, but she was like, yo, you do something fine today. I can dance, I can sing, I can draw, I can program, and I can do music. I decided to make a game a day. Why not? Jesus Lord, the ride right 2006. Been programming since I was in 6th grade. So I did this. Um, what day are you on? I'm on day 10. All right. Um, day 10 is not posted. It's only posted now. Um, look, look at this game right here. And day 9, the Bonsori plays, and his health goes down. <laughs> and that's Bonsori here. And um, I know there's no music every week. So I came a little prepared, everybody. Bonsori. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so when you play the game, there's live students? 
Yes, yes. I <laughs> pour the music and everything. And now here is the, the here is the goal. Goal number one <coughs> is that um, making video games are hard. This is C sharp. This is no tool assisted. This is X and A. So what I'm trying to do is make a framework or a skeleton that I call fast that allows you to prototype and make games really fast, but instead of just talking about it and like writing code and be like, this will help you make games fast, I make a game every day. And then I just take my code, you know, virtualize it, and you know, make it better. So you'll see, go to just day five, sir. Go to day five. Day five is a menu screen, right? Right, this is a menu, I'm just showing off a menu. You know, it takes a day to write a menu screen, but video game, that's the code. Uh, now go to day seven. Day seven is a breakout game, different art. I did all the art for Christ Jesus in the floor. Um, and then day four is spaghetti cat game. That's the last one I want to show people. Like, it's literally a spaghetti cat game. We all need to go, right? <laughs> Why not? If I'm going to make it in a day, you know. So what's going on here is that I'm learning that games have to be functional before they're fun, right? And making games that are fun is hard when you're a, a new programmer. But I'm not a new programmer. Making games off that are fun off is hard when you're doing it one day. So more and more as I do it every day, I'm trying to make a fun game. But for the first 20 days, it's just functional. If I make it sometime in day 20, 21, it's going to be a fun game. And 20, and after 21 through 40, you know, we keep going. So, uh, right. dear Lord, how about that, everybody? <laughs> I tried to get my Microsoft Game Design uh, certification today. Uh, they didn't want to give it to me. Other announcements? Mr. Alex? Hey everybody, uh, if you have a Divi membership, come talk to me after uh, because I want you to beta test a new old app for Divi members. So come see me after if you have a Divi membership. Cool. Uh, other announcements? Yeah, please. Um, <laughs> Two weeks ago, I, I came here for the first time and um, met up with some people, and we started a project. I'm going to start something with Alex too, but um, we started a little project, uh, sending some information from one of the Chicago websites on business solicitations. And we haven't gotten like we're not we don't have a full API yet, but um, I see it as an exercise in doing screen scraping, web scraping. Um, we're using EC2. We're we're using Python right now, but we could use a lot of different, different things. Uses Git. So anyone who's interested in, like, if you're interested with Git, you might be interested in taking a look at this. See if it sparks some interest, or maybe if some something you could yeah, look at these things. Yeah, well, that's where you I've start. Been that forever, right? Oh, really? But cool. all, only in a humble way. We're all we're all humble. We all start somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I'm interested in none of. The people in that group are here tonight, so if anyone else is interested in that kind of stuff, wants to help out or, or lack the code, come see me. It's awesome. The uh, CTA put out a request for proposals for doing artwork at three Blue Line stations. Um, is this part of the renovation project? The Blue Line renovation or separate? I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, but it's a public art project. I know nothing about art, so I can't really weigh in on this. Um, but if people have like some vision for like having some data visualization or electronic art or something like that, like you should probably start acting towards that now and like get in there so that we can be like surface editor or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, other announcements? Um, yeah, last week uh, we talked about uh, app we were working on is uh, STD and teen pregnancy hotspot detector in the state of Illinois. So it shows you like what uh, diseases or teen pregnancy uh, is prevalent in certain communities, but then also where the resources are located around it. So we've been rebuilding the platform using the Barracks map template. Um, right now we're about like we're almost finished with the location side, like being able to find locations around you in the next one, like the hotspot piece. But my filtering isn't really working, like my check boxes, Barracks um, map template. We're going to talk to him afterwards. If anyone else uh, has experience uh, using the, the template, uh, we'd love to get some advice and get some help. What template? Uh, Derek built a searchable map template. Uh, so these are two examples. Cool. Uh, yeah, I think Josh is also a good resource yeah. for that. Um, Nick, you know a little bit too, probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and right. So yeah, uh, but yeah, if you can't find me, just awesome. 
Uh, any other announcements? <coughs> yes. Um, well, so this is my first time here, but I just want to let you guys know about uh, something that my company just recently released. Uh, it's a mobile API. Uh, six lines of code that you can embed into your app. And uh, when you do so, it allows you to actually take payments through your app. So if anybody's looking to you know, turn their app into a revenue channel or way to, to get sales out of it, definitely uh, come talk to us. Which company is that? It's called Frugalit. Frugalit, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Uh, I have one announcement, which is the thing up here. Uh, so this weekend it snowed a bunch, and we used the opportunity to um, uh, make some improvements to this Blue Streets app that's been out for, this is our third winter. Uh, we got an article written about us in Vasco uh, last week. And from that, uh, we got to talking to a company called CardoDB. And they uh, ended up gifting us uh, one of their plans for using their service. Uh, and so we switched everything over to CardoDB uh, over the last week. And so now we have a pretty awesome map uh, that's using Leaflet and CardoDB. And then that animation that I was playing earlier is also part by CardoDB. So this is as of today. It's snowed again today. I've been literally like freaking out every time I look out the window because uh, I have to turn all this stuff on. Uh, but essentially, every time it snows, we, uh, the city of Chicago launches its cloud tracker. Uh, and then we go and read the data from that. And we draw the lines about where the plots are. And that's what this map represents. So this is uh, one, I think, like a three and a half hour uh, representation of where the plots were deployed. Uh, that uh, I think it started around 10 AM this morning. Uh, through maybe like uh, 1, 1.30. Uh, so uh, I just want to put this out here. Uh, and we're actually looking to make some other improvements to uh, some of the path inference stuff, which is essentially drawing these lines. There's some other libraries out there that are better than the ones we're currently using. So if anybody's interested in that and or knows Java, uh, I would like to talk to you about that. Um, so I guess without uh, any further ado, uh, we'll get to the main presentation. Uh, which will sort of be jointly presented by myself and Christopher uh, Juan uh, Juan Pablo Velez, uh, who's the third organizer to this event. He's in Colombia. He took an extended uh, holiday break on us, uh, so uh, we'll we'll be covering without him. Uh, but we basically just wanted to give you guys um, sort of a sense from uh, our perspective what the highlights <coughs> of this last year have been for the OpenGov Hackathon, and. Uh, oh, slides up cool. uh, and I'm actually I'm really happy that Nina gave her story. I'd love to hear more stories from you guys because I'm sure that we don't know really everything that goes on here. Uh, and I'd also like to get some of you guys' feedback at the end as, as far as what would you like to see more of? Uh, you know, or if you guys want more training or more uh, different kinds of speakers, that kind of stuff. But we'll get to that at the end. So. Uh, we'll start with, uh, oh, are you our screen guy? Mm -hmm. Okay, click. All right, so the very first thing uh, I'd like to point out is that we actually have a website, which is something that it seems simple uh, and something we should probably should have done a long time ago. But now we actually have a place to sort of collect all of our information about not only the, the event, but also the other things that are tied to this event. Uh, and so if you just click on the next screen. Uh, we've had, in the last year, 50 events. Uh, and 36 different speakers. Some of those speakers are actually in this room. Uh, Matthew is one. Uh, Ed is another. Am I missing anybody else? I feel like Steven, Josh. 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 Oh, yes, Josh. So we've had a lot of variety of speakers. And actually, like I said, I think that's something that I'd like to have more of in the next year is getting different departments uh, from different uh, local government agencies come and sort of present some of their uh, interests in open data and come to, come to us with some of their uh, technology they're using or questions they have. Uh, and I think we actually made a pretty good amount of progress this one year in getting a lot, a lot more people involved in this community. I think in the very beginning, it really just our only points of contact with the city government were John Tolba and Brett Goldstein and Kevin. Uh, and I think there was a bottleneck there. And eventually, enough of the word sort of spread to other people in the government. And they got to get to know what we are all about, and vice versa, and started coming here themselves. And I think you know, Ed is a great example of that. He came last week and talked about Chicago Park District uh, and theater. Yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so it's pretty great and pretty awesome to just sort of have a, a platform for uh, this sort of casual kind of conversation. Right? We try to keep another room is really packed, and it's kind of been like that maybe for the last six months. 
I'm really reluctant to make it into put it in a bigger space because if, if you put it in like an auditorium kind of setting, you lose some of the mm -hmm. kind of the, the interactions that happen. So I don't know if anybody has any suggestions on that. I'm actually open to it. But as far as this space in 1871, this is the biggest room of this kind uh, that doesn't cost any money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Are you guys limited to doing like one event every two weeks? It's every week. Oh, it's every week. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's every Tuesday. And that's kind of another sort of recipe for success that we found out early on is just so happens that if you have it at the same time in the same place uh, every week, uh, you don't have to advertise. People just know to come. Right? Um, one of the other things I wanted to point out is um, a thank you to the ladies who have been coming to Hack Night. Um, one of the things that Code for America is trying to do is you know make more diverse tech scene. And uh, a couple weeks ago, we had Mark Huber who was a Code for America fellow from last year, who's kind of bounced all across uh, these hack nights across the country. And he was really impressed that our, that it wasn't uh, 29 guys and one girl, or, uh, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so next slide, move on. Uh, so also part of that website, we have a projects page, which we try to sort of d document all of the projects that uh, people have been working on uh, that are related to uh, this night and also Chicago in general. As of now, last I checked, we have 110 on there, which is pretty great. Uh, and I think one of the goals that I have is to try to make this even easier to commit to. Right now, you can really just you can paste the GitHub. Uh, project URL and it'll show up on this list, which is pretty easy. But what if you don't know anything about GitHub and all that stuff? So I think that there are some tools. And actually, last week we uh, we were introduced to a tool um, made by some some people down in Buenos Aires called uh, Hackdash, and we it's basically a online collaboration tool uh, that lets you basically. Uh, Describe a project and then have a conversation about that project. It doesn't <coughs> doesn't related to GitHub at all unless you want it to be. Uh, and it's really just meant for people to sort of get together when people get together in, in rooms like this and maybe meet for the first time. It's a place for them to make sure that that connection can actually persist and and, and, and not have to worry about oh I forgot to get that person's email or I forgot to get uh, you know that contact information or whoops this project is now falling apart. So. Uh, the URL for that is hacknight.hackdash.org. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and if you guys have projects that you want to uh, start uh, collaborating on uh, in a public way, that's that's the place to do it. I'll have all uh, URLs to all this stuff at the end too. But that is something that I think is uh, I've already added a link to the projects page on on the Hacknight website to make that even uh, link link directly to that to that project. So I'd like to see more people using that. Or if you don't. Use it. Why is that? Not, is that not the right way to, to make it happen? I think it's a constant uh, struggle that we've had as organizers of this event to deal with the questions that we hear all the time, which is, "I'm a developer and I want to help out on the project." Uh, and then there's also people who say, "I have projects and I need help." It's hard to do that matchmaking, uh, even though it's like it sounds like what I just described. Oh, just put them together, right? Well, certain projects need certain kinds of skills or people maybe just don't care about your project, or vice versa. Uh, so it's really a challenge, especially for us as sort of volunteers, and again, a group of this size, about 50 people. It's hard for us to be, like, we can't ever be a project manager. I don't want to be the project manager for like 50 projects. I, I kind of, the point of this event is to get everyone together and to let you self-organize, and not sort of have this over, like, sort of over the shoulder, like, oh, are you doing this or that or the other? So, yeah, this is sort of an open uh, issue. I think it's not just a problem that the Hack Night has. I think it's a problem with uh, uh, working in, on volunteer projects at all. Uh, and so, you know, it's something that I think this Hack Dash project can help with. And there's tools that can kind of start making that problem more tractable. Uh, but it is a pretty hard one, right? It's, it's you know, there's like companies that spend like lots of money trying to do this matchmaking thing in a lot of different ways. So it's uh, by no means simple. But if anybody has any Thoughts or feedback on that. By the way, if you want to interrupt now, that's fine. If you have thought right now, uh, please feel free. Yeah. So you bring up project management, and that's something I've been thinking about. Like the like working on either just this little project with people I've met here. Like, well, sometimes I feel like I'm looking for someone to take the lead, mm -hmm. and maybe I just need to take the lead. Yeah. You know, um, it seems like sometimes 
someone just, as you said, needs to be the project manager. Do you yeah. have any tips that you could share or about, like, you've, you've worked collaborative with other people. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and I often do exactly what you said. I start doing stuff. And then sometimes people, uh, you know, we have a team and we work well together. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say that um, it's, uh, it's hard in general to organize volunteers. And I've seen, in actually very early days of the Hack Night, we got groups coming in and asking for help, saying, you people represent a, uh, a pool of resources that I can tap into. And I can ask you to do things and build things, and you'll just do it. Uh, that never panned out. Like, uh, like if someone just shows up and says, build this for me, nerds, uh, it just never happens, right? Uh, but, I mean, but that's what some people, I think that's what was actually like, I don't know, maybe that was what they thought. Like they thought people just eager to just do anything. Uh, but it's not exactly that, right? Like you guys want to work on a project, but you want to work on something that interests you, right? right, and, right, that, right. and that you know, then you, you agree with the, the philosophy and the principles behind it and all that kind of stuff, right? And that's, you know, it's hard to get that, that matchup. Okay. There's the opposite end of that, which is, oh, I have this idea of a thing, and I don't know, like the, the almost not being forceful enough in, mm -hmm. in terms of shaping the project. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a clear vision and somebody who's willing to sort of take the first steps and being that sort of person that takes the rein from the beginning, uh, then your project can equally have a, a, a high chance of failure, right? Mm -hmm. It just won't get done, right? So kind of walking that fine line in between that I've seen uh, be the most successful. I think the school cut site is a pretty good example of Volunteer, although yes, you could technically say that it was a Webatex sponsored project as resources came from Webatex, but it was how many volunteers? Like seven? Yeah. Right? Which I think is almost like the maximum I've observed possible to have a group of, like a collective group of people sort of accomplish something significant. Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Uh, Shared Google documents, <laughs> uh, good email communication. Um, would you find one person to lead uh, and sort of everybody else got around or was yeah, it over time? It varied a lot. I think just yeah. having multiple people very interested so that yeah. if one person wasn't, then somebody else is taking the lead. Right. Um, yeah, and so to me, it seemed like Jeannie uh, was like sort of the beginning. You and Jeannie working together was the beginning of it. And then I think people like Al Nasleder came in and took over some of the project management. So this is that's yeah. kind of stuff, right? And so that handing off kind of thing. Yeah, you know, that doesn't always work out though, right? Um, so you know, if maybe maybe what we need is more people who are willing to be that project manager type person. Yeah. Well, uh, I just want to concur and say that that's also something that we. Um, sort of witnessed and watched at the CNT hackathon, which had those three kind of matchup meetings. And like, yeah, and I wasn't there for that. I, that's why I have no idea how. It yeah, and I think that um, so one thing about our philosophy of design is that we were trying to engage student leaders and teacher leaders in the whole process, and so we found the agile development models were really useful because creating really good <coughs> user stories that focus on the end user experience is a really good way to get everyone on the same page who might be coming from a number of different backgrounds. And for me personally, I would love to, um, I definitely wouldn't want to task you both with managing different projects, but it might be great to have more speakers who could talk about different project management techniques. Mm -hmm. um, and then particularly around this problem of developing tools and languages that people from a wide range of backgrounds can glom onto together and share. Um, we found that to be helpful, and we also noticed that that folks that didn't have that shared language seemed to have a lot more trouble forming teams. Yeah. So yeah. Like, yeah. Just as a day jobs. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Does that sound like it's something that anybody else would be interested in, yeah. in, in hearing a talk uh, from someone who has project management management experience and sort of how to specifically, I think, volunteer because that's a special case, right? Because yeah. you can't tell anybody what to do when they're volunteers. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's just it's okay, vibes, right? I don't like you, right? Uh, not, you're not like you don't have any like you're not paying, right? Yeah. Right. So it's I think if uh, we can think about who would be a good candidate for that, but I think. That sounds like a beast. Perhaps some leader to vote some projects might be the way of doing that, so they kind of have to do it by default. Right. That's a good point. Um, I think that open source projects, I mean, you have, we have tools now, right, like GitHub, where it is easy for, if you know the protocol, right, if you know how to use 
uh, pull requests and you know, properly commit your code and comment on it. There is a process in which, if you know that, you can speak this common language with anybody in the world, right? But you have to get to that point. You have to be a, first of all, you're a programmer. Like, I mean, yes, non-programmers use GitHub, but the most effective open source contributors are people who are programmers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's it's kind of that I think, but it's also there's another element that's actually I think there's a lot of value when you have people physically in a room, right? Which is why we have this event, right? When when you're actually staring at someone and having a conversation, you get different results than if it was just that's all like cyber login on Tuesday and like, you know, in this IRC channel and like let's do stuff. I mean, things like that still happen, but I think there's something unique that we get out of having a like a space like this. So one of the good point. part of my day job is sort of helping to manage technology projects. And I use GitHub without knowing all, I know some of the programming, but not enough to be dangerous at all. Um, and so that is that is kind of a limiting factor, as I know, you know, I can log issues and I can say sort of on the UX, I go to the site and it's doing this, it's repeatable, but then when you ask, like, to look into the code, I might as well be looking at, like, a brain surgery thing, because I don't know what I'm doing once I get in there. Um, so it's, there is some translating, and the more of the programming you know, the more it helps with the programming, like making sure the code works. On the flip side, whenever I'm part talking to an organization whose day job is not shipping code or product, but you know providing flu shots or providing city services or <coughs> trying to help people get signed up for Obamacare, the coding aspect of it isn't as important as does it work for the user. Right. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we, this year, uh, Smart Chicago started to do civic user testing, mm -hmm. where any civic app that asks, we will tap one, a group of one of 400 uh, different testers around the city, put everybody in a room and actually do user testing <coughs> on your app. That way we can see this part's working, this part's not working, this part's great, this part needs a little work. I think, um, Again, talking about a little bit of the, the sort of open source and using GitHub and all that stuff, I think that one of the real advantages that I've seen uh, of this group and the projects that I think are the most successful are the ones that aren't strictly run just by programmers. It's the ones that have the collaborative group, right? I mean, like again, like Jeannie is not a programmer. She is a quantitative analysis uh, analyst, I believe, and CPS mom and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, and so it's likely the people who know that know a particular domain space can add a tremendous amount of value to <coughs> projects. I mean, I always like to make fun of myself. I'm like, hey, I'll like some, I'll put some dots on a map, and here you go, right? But I don't know what that means, right? As a, as a developer, like, it's very easy to just make a map, right? Or to do some little gizmo thing. But it's, I've found you know, over, the, over the years that that's not often very productive just to do that. It's more of a, 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 a showcase of the tool than it is actually doing something that has any real meaning to anybody uh, than yourself, right? So it's really finding the people that know a particular issue and working with them. And so I think GitHub is, uh, again, a good way to collaborate to do that. But maybe, maybe it means we need more GitHub training, or maybe it means you know we, we find some other ways of of collaborating that are more useful, right? Like maybe this hack dash thing, right? And honestly, Google Docs and Google Spreadsheets are like pretty effective too, uh, just because it's pretty easy for anybody to get access to that. One more thing I wanted to bring up that um, I like. One thing I, I would really love is some kind of discussion area, you know, discussion board where we could continue this conversation. Like I don't, I'm not going to meet everyone tonight. I'm going to talk to a few people, but um, it would be really. <coughs> It seems elementary. Maybe this you've already tried this and it doesn't work. Maybe people don't do this, but like a shared space that's not super technical, just a discussion space. Mm -hmm. We can bring up ideas, talk about, hey, I'm interested in this. I come from, you know, the school district or mm -hmm. the school um, system or the parks or something. I want to do this. Yeah. And people can pipe in and say, "Well, here's what's out there." And sure. So on. Is there anything like that? Uh, I mean, what what we use to broadcast the, the these, these emails? Do you guys all get emails whenever we have a hack night? There's a a, a, a <coughs> server you can join. Um, we also share it on this group, this Google group that's been around for maybe four years now, the Open Gov Chicago oh. Google group. And that's sort of something that we when we started doing this event, we just started posting everything on there as well. 
just because we didn't want to add to the noise of like another group that does this. But it could warrant like something that's maybe because that's very much any a lot of people on that. There's like maybe like over two thousand people on that list. Quick question: Who is actually on the Open Go Chicago list? Okay. Okay. So I'm fair about half. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could be on it today. Great. Yeah. I really like what Nick's saying though, and I think um, one part of it that I don't even know if you were saying, but I'm just gonna say is that um, maybe if there's a space where people's names and even pictures can be like a little OAuth thing with Twitter, so you can just say who you are, because I think the thing about once every week. If you don't go every week, you're here once every two weeks. It's just a perfect amount of time to forget people's names and like, <laughs> prevent a real right. cohesiveness. Yeah, that's actually, so that's, let's you know. I'll show the next slide too. And keep talking for a minute. Because well, so well, so so we have this, right? Well, it's it's sort of that, but it's only, this is again tied to GitHub, right? So we yeah. submit a project to our thing. We'll collect all the information from GitHub about that project. If you work on that project, you get thrown up on our. Our, our gamification hacking <laughs> list here. Um, but yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, right? Having some sort of like a way of knowing more about the group. Uh, is that well, something? This, is, this yeah. is project once it's already a project. Right. Exactly. And I'm thinking like pre projects. Right. Like baseball cards. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a bad example, but I don't know how to do graphical baseball cards. But here's the face, here's the Twitter handle, here's what they do, and there you go. Okay, well, let's, I mean, the thing is, this Hackdash project that uh, that was presented last week that we're all starting to use now uh, was a project that came out of a hackathon. Uh, and it was like a meta project. They were like, we don't want to work on the project for the hackathon. We want to work on a project for hackathons. <laughs> and so maybe what maybe that's what we're describing here. I, I would I would actually encourage if you guys are interested in this sort of stuff, maybe there's a tool already out there that does. This. Right, uh, and if not, then build. It. But I, I, that's always a step that is like really like crucial. <laughs> but a lot of people always skip. It's like, does this thing already exist? Right, and, and I bet you it does. Right, something like that. Um, so if you guys have suggestions on that, uh, yeah, Google. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, oh, small question. Oh yeah, sure. Everything you said was beautiful. It was a real thing I've heard. Uh, what? Um, I see the location is all in Chicago. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for one on the south side. Yeah, so the side. Uh, okay. So the way that we get this information is yeah. it's self-reported. So I have a GitHub profile, and on there I've chosen to list my location as Chicago. Right. I could have said Logan Square, Chicago. Right. But I think it's kind of a common thing for people to say it's city and state. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't. The uh, <laughs> Robin did a uh, what the. He put the GitHub with um, people's wards. Oh yeah, <laughs> from Chicago, uh, right? Right, and that would do that, but I don't think it ever to a call. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's uh, that was a project that was started by this guy Scott Rapid, yeah. who wanted to link developers to their ward, uh, mm -hmm. and you basically just signed up again through GitHub, and you got added to this map. Uh, you associate yourself with the ward. And I don't know if anything came out of it, but one idea was once you have enough people in a certain ward, then you try to organize those people and say, okay, let's all get together and work on something that relates to our neighborhood, right? And I think um, some of that code was then taken in, and some of the ideas were taken in to the cut group, right? That's what Chicago runs. Uh, but it's not, it's not like for everybody to see the list of people, right? You right. Publish I, that. I publish a map of the testers, right? So initially, and part of it, Part of this speaks to you, right? We do need more people from all over Chicago coming to these things. We, when we sent out the invites for the cut group, we said, okay, you sign up, we'll give you five bucks. So people signed up, and if you looked at the map, north side, Hyde Park, we had to send street teams to get to the south and west side. So we actually cut off signups for. Um, several of the north side wards because we're like, we already know you're using our apps, we already have enough people, we we don't necessarily, we don't care, it's just we don't care. <laughs> we want it, uh, sort of the south and west sides more evenly distributed. So we sent street teams, we got it, actually now we have at least 10 testers from every ward we can draw from. Yeah. Uh, but that was part of that effort is, you know, hey, don't I don't. I always 
hate the fact that all of our maps look exactly the same, whether it's um, health-related, crime-related, um, property value-related, foreclosure-related, they're all the same map. And sort of when we're producing apps, I didn't want our testing group to be sort of the same map as everything else. I wanted, uh, no, Dana, I wanted sort of to get everybody so that when we do test an app, we know it's working for both north and south and west sides. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, so that's a good discussion. And then actually, um, maybe uh, that's part of the that second part of the hack night is break off into groups and have conversations and work on stuff. So that's that's something that we'll, we'll put everything on the board that if anybody's interested in talking about. But that seems like like a great discussion to have <coughs> with, the, with the, the, the subgroup here. Uh, this is another page on the Hack Night site. Uh, it's something we started like maybe a month ago to document all of the open data, uh, which is data that's available in the Chicago region. Uh, we have the data portals listed here, and then we have this sort of list of random web pages that you could possibly scrape, uh, or that have little random things you can download a PDF, like CPS has a lot of that, or some random tables you could download or CSV files. And the goal of this, uh, of this page is to sort of say, here's what's out here. Because uh, oftentimes the, the, the question is, I want to do this. Is there data for that, right? Uh, and so this is meant to sort of get to that question. Um, so this is all open source, so if anybody wants to add to this, we have a Google spreadsheet that we're using to populate this table. Um, so if, was, has anybody used this yet? Does anybody find this useful? Mm -hmm. Yes, just you? I'll let you go on it, just like search. Just yeah. I got a little browsers. search box in here. You can look for like schools, like that, so, right? Way down at the bottom of this page is yes. also infrastructure resources. Yes. You do not need to host your own Civic app. Smart Chicago has hosting. We will host it. Uh, we do Civic testing. We have a Google business license. I think Alex actually is the first one to, nice. to bust that open. Um, the other infrastructure is, uh, what am I forgetting on the other side? Oh, we, we just linked to GitHub pages, which is a free pages. place to host your, your Atlas Heroku. This is another resource for hosting uh, apps for free and free tier. Um, <coughs> like um, so I don't know, I'm open to other suggestions on this site, too. Again, it's all open source. And if you have questions on it, I mean, does anybody have any critique or anything they'd like to see added to this page? I have a question. Do all these link back to uh, Open Data Chicago? It's uh, opengovhacknight.org. Uh, it's the name of the website. Um, but the data sets themselves. Oh, no, they don't link back. We just always link to them. Um, they don't. They probably don't even know who No, I, I'm asking where the majority of the data that Oh, where all, the, the all these data sources are? Right. Oh, a lot of them are random websites hosted by various government agencies. Um, you know, you're going to have. Uh, Pages on the City of Chicago website, some of them, um, which are like sort of sub apps. And then there's, you know, like CPS has its own <coughs> website. You know, the Water District has its own website. So it's actually kind of hard to find all these things. Um, mm -hmm. Google can get you so far, right? But it actually took uh, a few people, specifically this one guy, Forrest Gray, who spoke a few weeks ago, uh, to to actually crawl through all this stuff and say, okay, this is a data page. This is a page on screen. And that's what this really was. Maybe that would be a good column to add there. Like, this data is also available in CSV download or something. Right. Or maybe, like, this is an API, this is a page of right. Some sort of, like, information okay. about how you get that data out of it. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I thought about that one. <laughs> OK, cool. Um, all right, I guess we'll move on then to the next uh, page. Um, <laughs> obligatory pizza graphic. <laughs> uh, I'm reading it now. We read a lot of it. You can't talk about the review without talking about all the things we eat. Uh, <laughs> however, is there any other feedback on food? I ordered pizza because Lumanati's is two blocks down the street, and it's heavy, and it's also bang for the buck, probably one of the cheaper ways to get food. Uh, that being said, we're not, you know, I don't know who's gluten uh, insensitive or sensitive here, or who's got, you know, this sort of lactose thing. So is, is pizza fine? Sometimes we do sandwiches. Uh, I'm open to other ideas about food, uh, as long as it is low cost and not hard to get, right? But we can do both of them. Um, so if anybody has feedback, we can talk about food right now. Uh, all right, now next slide. So uh, that's sort of the highlights of like sort of the main parts 
certain time of the website, but also this event. Um, I think that one of the kind of the neat things about this happening is some of the stories that came out of it this last year. Uh, and they're sort of unique to this group. And I think that these kinds of stories that, that at least that I've thought of, and I would love to hear some of yours too if you guys have any, uh, only really could have come out of having this sort of unique mix of people, right? Which we have developers, we have designers, we have uh, city employees, former city employees, data scientists, researchers, am I missing anybody? Students, right? So it's just really a wide variety, right? Mm -hmm. And it's because of that variety, I think we get a lot of really cool things to happen. So next slide. This, uh, this is a story that I love to tell. Um, I've told a few people before, I don't know if we've told the Hack Night this exact story, but uh, back in, I believe it was February, we had a guy in Indies come to this Hack Night and demo something called OpenStreetMap. Does anybody know what that is? A couple people? Those of you who don't know, oh, you have a definition. OpenStreetMap is Wikipedia for maps. Anybody right. can go in and edit and add details to things and make the map better. Yeah. If you use Foursquare, you've seen OpenStreetMap, even if you aren't aware of it. Yeah. So this guy, Ian, uh, saw that the city of Chicago had published on the data portal this uh, set of building footprints, which is essentially uh, every building in the city, you have basically the footprint it takes up. Uh, if you look sort of straight down, like, OK, Merchandise Mart is like you know, this whole couple blocks, right? So it's basically a shape file, which is like a geospatial file for showing where all the buildings are in Chicago, right? Very cool, right? Mm -hmm. Also atta uh, attached to these uh, building shape files is the address of that particular building. So Ian said, hey, this is a cool thing. I would love to import this into OpenStreetMap uh, because it will help make OpenStreetMap way better. We get to see all the buildings, right, in addition to all the roads and everything. But that address information will actually make uh, our, our geocoder, our address search, way better, right? Because if you know where the exact addresses are of each building, you can pinpoint a building uh, which is like, you know, that's kind of how Google does it, right? And so they wanted to improve this open source platform, right? So he started doing it, and then he got about halfway through importing. It's like, he looks like really interesting to watch. He does like chunks at a time, and you can kind of see him like painting like these buildings onto the map. And he got about halfway, actually right around where my house is, and <laughs> all of a sudden he stopped. And it, this, the maps were actually in that state for probably six months or so. And the reason he stopped was because other people in the OpenStreetMap community said, no, you can't import this data. It's not open. It's not truly open. Yes, it's on this data portal, but there exists this license on, on the data portal that the city applies to all of its data, data sources, the data sets, which says, at any point in time, the city can take that data and ask you to remove it from your website. And that is a like, legally uh, like binding thing that they say they have the power to do for any data set that's published on the city, uh, city of Chicago data portal. The city mostly does that because if it makes a mistake and then you publish the mistake, the city wants to be able to go, the data is wrong, if you can take it down, we'll give us, we'll replace it. But there's, there is that right. Hold on. I've heard it described as an emergency break. If something goes crazy, they want to have the power to take it down, right? Well, that didn't mesh with the open data kind of policy that OpenStreetMaps has. They were very worried about having to deal with this particular issue. If they, if they ever got that request, it would be a huge burden for them to go and pluck out all these buildings, and they just didn't want to have to do it. So we stopped. They didn't make him remove the data. They just said to stop doing it. So for, like I said, for a while, six months or so, half the city had buildings, and half the city did not. It was basically like east of uh, like Western or something like that, everything. There's no building. So we had Ian come to the Hack Night to demo, uh, uh, demo OpenStreetMap. And while he was doing so, Juan, this is all Juan's doing, by the way. Uh, Juan said, oh, hey, what's with those buildings not being there? And very publicly pointed out, like, this is, like, why is this broken? And some people from the city were there that night and saw that this was a concern and heard the story that I just told you. Uh, well, two weeks later, the city of Chicago announced that they were publishing certain data sets on GitHub, and they were doing so with an open license, a truly open license that anybody can use. Mm -hmm. And the reasoning behind that was, well, this reason that they have this 
sort of emergency break sort of clause for pulling the data does not apply to some data sets, right? There's not really any downside to the city publishing these buildings. So they said, for these, it's OK. And they said, well, bike routes, I believe bike racks, the pedway, uh, and then also the building footprints and the street center line. They all published on GitHub. And it got some, some attention on Reddit. And they got a big thing on Hacker News. And it was like a big victory for the city. And Ian got to finish importing all the buildings. So if you go to OpenStreetMap right now, you can actually see all the buildings. And that, I don't want to say the hack night made that happen, but we played a very, very tiny part in this entire narrative that I just told you. And I think it had a lot to do with the fact that, again, we had someone like Ian here talking from this community, OpenStreetMap, and someone from the city hearing him and saying, we could do something. And I think that that is actually a story that I want to hear more and more. Right. And I think it has happened in places. But that is that is something that only I think this could have happened at this time. And now Chicago is actually one of the most <coughs> detailed cities in North America for the street. Okay. Mm -hmm. So kind of cool, right? Um, and and yeah. there's there's a new event coming up in January. A new event for OpenStreetMap? The OpenStreetMap and OpenStreetMap attack. You met last year in this room. Oh, yeah, 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 right. And, and they had the 24-hour uh, round-the-world hackathon. Oh, OK. And I was, was here. Awesome. That's and, great. And there's one coming up in January. And so cool. you can go to OpenStreetMap. So if anybody's interested in like mapping data like that, there's a group that meets, um, I think, uh, I don't know, do they have a website? Is it like OpenStreetMap.us? OK. Yeah. So anyways. Uh, some people like that's a that's a group that's if you're interested. In. Uh, next slide. Um, and I keep putting you on the spot, Josh. Oh, uh, you want? It? Okay, go for it. Um, so one of the so I was at the UIC Urban Forum uh, past about a week or two weeks ago. Uh, UIC Forum is just a place where you know thought leaders and people in charge of things get together to talk about urban <coughs> issues. And you had a panel of uh, former CTO uh, John Tolba, Susanna Vasquez from LISC, uh, and a number of other technology public slash public officials. And they were talking about different things and different ways that cities were using data and technology. And one of the things that got brought up was school cuts. Now, school cuts has been up for like nine months, almost nine months later. Like, the schools have been closed. It's sort of a done deal. It's a dead issue. And people are still talking about this. Why? Because it addressed something that very much concerned the city residents and was a very hot topic. And it actually helped change the debate around school closings. Um, in, was, I believe it was November, Chicago Public Schools sent out a message that said, hey, there's these 150 schools we're thinking about closing. Uh, because we're over, because the schools are uh, now have very low attendance and we can't afford it, and this freaked parents out because the CPS had open data out there, but they had it in seven different places. Some of it was buried in Excel files, so it was buried in PDFs, and it was very confusing for anyone trying to get information, uh, particularly parents who needed to know what was going on. So. Josh Kalov teamed up with Jeannie Olson, who was heavily involved in one of the teacher parent groups. And they started building schoolcuts.org to sort of pull all this information into one place. So on the site, they get demographics. They had a map of everything around it. They had attendance. They had test scores. They had sort of an explanation on why CPS considered it Consider the schools underutilized, and parents loved it. And they didn't just stop there. They went back to the parents after they built it and said, okay, here's what we got. What do you think? Give some more feedback. So they added you know, a discussion table. They added a section of the website to compare the school that was closing with the school that was supposed to be receiving that student. They translated it into Spanish and just kept going back and forth between sort of their the team today that they have, and the parent groups to make sure that the site was working for them. They had people 
printing out these pages and bringing it to the Chicago Public School hearings on the school closing. Initially, you had a lot of talk in the media, a lot of rhetoric, a lot of back and forth saying, oh, you're an evil, evil man. Oh, you're just not understanding and you're being unreasonable. But once this started coming out, and once people started pointing out things like test scores and enrollment and sort of all the different data points behind the school closing, you sort of saw a shift in the news coverage and in the dialogue going from just sort of pure rhetoric to, okay, what do the numbers actually say about school closing? How much money are we actually going to save by doing this? Are we really going to send the kids to a new school if you have the lowest classified school to another level three lowest classified school? And people are still talking about this months after this, the final school cut decision was announced. So this is probably my favorite app of the year just because it addressed a topic that people really very much cared about and were fighting about and presenting the information that people needed in a way that sort of was sort of by the facts, this is the data, this is everything that's going on. I've talked to Alderman, automatic staff who've used this instead of CPS's own site. Uh, journalists were going to this site. This was the place to go if you wanted the just the facts. So this, more of this. Uh, <laughs> and now that I've completely embarrassed Josh, she was. Uh, <laughs> I was to say, so the group came together at half night. We had all pretty much known each other, um, but right over there. Um, we had, I hope we both had some ideas of things to do, and then some other people were looking for a project to work on. That's kind of how we got started. Um, and I think we started slow, actually, um, kind of looking uh, first, um, just kind of taking a couple schools and looking at data available. Um, and then a big part of the site, um, and Lincoln Chandler is not here, was a huge part of that, uh, formulating specific questions to answer. Um, and everything we were doing then from that point kind of guided the, um, if I'm a parent or a student or a teacher, um, what information would I want to know? Um, and that's kind of what that what guided this way. Um, yeah, I think that that sort of says sort of a thing that I've learned over the, my course of making some of apps is that, like I said earlier, it's not about technology. It's about what can you actually say, what question can you answer with the data? Uh, first of all, is there even the data to do that, right? I think what your guys' issue to begin with is so much, right? How do we put this, some sort of story behind this that makes sense to anybody, right? Yeah. And I think that uh, having somebody like Lincoln, right, to help frame that, again, Lincoln's not a, he's not a tech person, although I think he's not a program, uh, but he brought his sort of experience uh, on the policy side to help frame this question, right? So, thanks. Any other questions about the site? Yeah. Well, well, a suggestion, I mean, I think one of the lessons from the site is that there's such an opportunity with design, taking yeah. information that's already there and designing it way better makes it way more relevant. So maybe for our speaker list for next year, we can have more design-oriented folks. Oh, um, we, we yeah. A design professor. Yeah, last year we had, or this year we had um, Brandon Mulligan from the Night Lab come and do uh, sort of a uh, design sort of brainstorm session. Did anybody here for that? Who did that? No? Okay. Okay. Well, anyways, we can get, try to get it back, right? Perhaps some more design uh, stuff. I mean, yeah, this has a lot to do with um, the desire to work on the test. Oh, they are awesome. Um, okay. Uh, Did CPS cooperate in any way? Uh, <laughs> I answer that. <laughs> CPS official? Uh, yeah. Cooperate? Uh, no, yes, no, I mean, not, there wasn't really any. So you just used what they had out there. Yeah, I mean, everything we used was already available, mostly from CPS, some of it uh, from the state. Some people, there were some interactions on Twitter with CPS. Yeah, definitely. Right? There was. Um, so there was a debate that. Like, they were helpful. That's not true. I mean, there was a couple instances where they were helpful. Um, one of the things that 
the site showed was the um, potential in the attendance boundaries after the closed schools, and that be was because um, CPS specifically you know, gave us the data um, and released it. But so there was. Uh, all right, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, data science for social good, if you guys heard of this thing. Uh, I wouldn't say this was born necessarily as a hack night, but this is something that Juan uh, worked on, and uh, Matt e, uh, and also uh, another person who probably done. Uh, so essentially, uh, there was a desire by those three to uh, take uh, a lot of this energy around open data uh, and do something with it at a big scale. And it just so happened that uh, Ryan Mead happened to know uh, Eric Schmidt, and Eric Schmidt gave him some money and decided to spend this money on bringing 36 data scientists, uh, mostly uh, um, uh, students who are either graduates or postgraduates, uh, to Chicago to work on data science projects uh, for social good. Uh, those projects included uh, doing uh, work with Divi uh, data, to try to help them figure out where to, um, uh, how to balance, load balance all the bikes, uh, uh, make sure that they have distribution of that. They did uh, some work with CTA to help them with bus crowding. Uh, they did some work with uh, this group called Ushikidi to do disaster response. I think they were all told about eight different projects. And I think why I like to mention this uh, in relation to this night is that they're very closely tied together. A lot of they came and presented a lot of their projects here at this group. Uh, and also, this is sort of a representation of what some of the things that we're working on could be if you give it like through a ton of resources, right? And so they worked on some of the very same problems that some of us had, had spent some time on. There was some 311 work done on uh, trying to figure out the uh, distribution of 311 calls and sort of trying to do some some uh, analysis of that. Uh, so this is happening again next year, uh, I believe. And I think that you know our hope is to continue to have more interaction between this group and that group. Actually, at a hack night. We had a, a, a Divi themed hack night about uh, sometime in the fall or summer, and uh, we just talked about the different data sets that were available, different data that was available about Divi, mostly where the stations are and how many bikes are available and all that stuff. From the, the hack night, they actually ended up partnering with Divi officially and like doing some work with them. So this hack night actually helped sort of facilitate that particular connection, and good things came out of it. Um, any other thoughts on uh, comments on space after social media? Let's we'll move on. For, I, can, I can feel an antsiness in my real quick. So that's not everything, but those are sort of the three, some three uh, good stories that at least that I uh, thought were interesting this year. Um, I just want to highlight a few other interesting things. We won't have to go into them very much. You can just keep firing off clear streets I showed you, um, red eye homicide data, which happened a couple weeks ago. Tarbell uh, was presented by the Tribune uh, news apps team, uh, David Eads, for making websites uh, really easily with Google Docs. Uh, the City of Chicago Data Dictionary was launched this year uh, and presented here at the Hack Night. It's essentially a catalog of all the different databases that the city has, public or not public, and, it's the, and they publish the schema for all of those data sets. Uh, databases, Chicago Works for You, which is a, a three-in-one uh, sort of dashboard tool built by Smart Chicago. Uh, go to School, a project by Tom Compine, who's a, a civic hacking wonderkind here in Chicago, uh, about how to uh, fi finding what school that your kids go to and then figuring out the directions uh, and when you need to leave to get there on time. Uh, Inglewood Codes, which is uh, uh, run by uh, Damon Drummer, teach uh, high school students, the high school or junior high? Uh, high school. High school students to learn how to program, um, absolute beginners to learn how to program down in Inglewood, and also work with the Raspberry Pi. Uh, EatSafe.co is an app by uh, a local publication at Lloyd, uh, essentially show you where all the food inspections uh, happened and what their status was, so you can go look at, you know, see all the failed McDonald's or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know that yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, no, it was Roberto Morales. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He built that, yeah. He, he was uh, another guy that's associated with David Eads from the uh, news app team. Yeah, they group called uh, uh, Supreme Chai Coding Crew. Uh, they meet every Saturday in Logan Square. Do you go, Randy? Yeah. Uh, and uh, Wilberto just sort of 
I don't know how he got connected to that group. Will, Will Berger. Will Berger, I'm sorry. Uh, and he uh, he got hired by OI, and they built this app. This is his first sort of app, and it was a, a Django app, I think, or a Flask app, maybe. Flask. Uh, yeah, Flask, yeah. yeah. It's all open source. It's great. Uh, major, like, you know, news, like, publication in Chicago. Open source app. Uh, other than Tribune. Uh, Chicago Consumatic is a tool that we launched in the summer for uh, following and subscribing to legislation passed by the Chicago City Council. Uh, and then Divi Data, I mentioned that one before. Um, that, these all link to a, uh, 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 we're going to share the slides with us so you can kind of browse to all these. Uh, and then actually in January of uh, this year, we launched uh, another open city app called Second City Zoning to help you uh, find out what uh, your particular, uh, what address uh, is, uh, how it's zoned. Right? So you can look up your, your home address and see it looks like it's a residential R3, or you can look up you know, downtown and see merchandise and artists and sort of special planning district. Uh, and it sort of made it fun by uh, throwing in some sound effects and colors from Sin City 2000. <laughs> Zoning is kind of boring otherwise. Um, so, yeah, next slide. Last one. So I hinted at some of this stuff earlier on, and I think we actually already had some good conversation about it, but just to highlight a few things. I think that I'd like to gauge interest, but I think that maybe more workshops would be useful. Um, learning Git, right? Is the people like I feel like if we had like every month or every two months like a Git or GitHub session, do you think that, that would be useful? I hear some see some heads nodding. Um, Christopher, as every week, does his open dub one oh one and I think you always have enough people that want to do that, right? Yeah, usually it's uh, four or five, which works because then people can ask questions and uh, sort of smaller is better than that. Right. Um, I may actually revamp that for the new year. Um, we started doing that actually at the beginning of this year, um, partly as an onboarding process. Um, one of the, me being a non programmer, when I first started coming to the hackathons and people were talking about Ruby and Python and my first interaction was, why are they talking about Julie and Snicks? <laughs> so we figured that having an onboarding process just to say, OK, here's what all the jargon means. Here's how the nights work. Here's where all the resources and everything is. And here's how you can get involved would sort of be a useful thing. Um, this got picked up by the uh, National Day of Civic Hacking Effort. And so we uploaded the video onto YouTube and then it went sort of everywhere. Um, we had multiple cities using the video for uh, sort of, they showed it at the beginning of their event. So people who were doing the hackathons for the first time could sort of get a overview of what civic hacking was. So I was very like happy The civic hacking that. guru that like their face shows up. Like, everybody like, like, all hail the floating head. Civic <laughs> 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 hacking. <laughs> Um, it was, <laughs> I hope that's not what it looked like. <laughs> um, so yeah, more, I like more work. What other work besides GitHub and sort of the one-on-one, -on -one, what other, I know we mentioned design stuff, mm -hmm. uh, project management stuff, what else would be a useful sort of class, even if we have to go grab someone from someplace that usually doesn't come to these things? Um, what would be awesome more would be good. Good. What classes or what subjects or topics would be useful for uh, workshops or learnings? Mm -hmm. um, oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I come here because I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to see what someone else cares about because I feel sort of nihilistic sometimes. Um, <laughs> and I wonder if if it would be useful to have like, here's how, what you should care about. Here's like. Here are some things that are, really should matter to you. You just don't know about them because you're ignorant, whatever. Like someone telling me, like you really should care about your taxes or something else. Like some issue and some Chicago. exposition of what what are the issues out there. So getting beyond the data, like I'm here to listen to people who care. And so if it was like a collection of those kinds of things, like this is what motivates people. So like getting someone from DCFS or Child Protective Services in here to talk about sort of their day-to-day -day and why you should care about DCFS or I'm from sanitation, I help pick up the trash. Here's why you should care about trash. Yes. Yeah. Like that. That, well, that, like, that's very specific, so like in a particular topic. Or a more broad, like here's generally as a city liver or you know a resident of 
the city or the state or the country, here are things that should concern you. Or, uh, concern uh, you're going to get a lot of opinions. That's what yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. How does that move from someone not, like, we used to do this, people said, build this for me. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's super super broad, maybe. It's tough, right? Because uh, you ask anybody, you know, you ask someone from the streets of sand, they're going to tell you what their problems are. Everybody's got problems, right? Yeah. And it's hard to figure out what to care about, right? And what to work on. What? And even of all the things that you could work on, is there anything that you could actually do to make a difference? Yeah. Like that's another question on its own, right? I think the best example of how this has worked is uh, last October, uh, we had um, a group of people from the Chicago Health Department come in and say. You know, flu season's coming up. We'd really like an easier way to tell people where to get a flu shot. And Tom Kapare was at that head, right, and started building stuff. Um, and that's then uh, Chicago Public Health saw that, loved it, officially adopted it as an app. So if you go to chicagoflushots.org, there's the app. Um, I thought the origin of that story was Tom saw a list of addresses on the City of Chicago website, and that pissed him off. He decided to make a map on his own. I think he started looking okay. at the at the hack. Okay. Well, because I mean, my impression is that oftentimes some of the better projects are the ones where the developers scratching their own itch, right? Where it's like, ah, this is so annoying. I can fix this with my magic developing skills, right? That is a common thing that happened too, right? Nothing replaces giving a name. <laughs> so yeah, that's true. yeah, one thing the the flu shot thing that was important. Um, is that when you, when you talk about need-based stuff, like some of this isn't rocket science. Like it's cold, the flu is coming. People need vaccinations. They need flu shots. It's a public health sort of large concern. Tom saw an issue, which is that it was a list of community centers on a website. The health department is going bananas trying to communicate, communicate, communicate. But they put all the ads they want on the buses. People still couldn't figure out where to go. Yeah. Um, but so they needed the, he needed the data in a, in a more usable format. The health department can do that. His, he's like, I'll build the, the map and use your map and build the thing. Yeah. Um, that was then deployed to other cities. We gave Philadelphia, yeah. we gave yeah. New York, we gave to Boston. Yeah. I think Philly had theirs up within like 48 hours. Using yeah. the same template, they just plugged in their data. Yeah. So it's one of these things that's building off um, broad scale concerns. And then that got a lot of, it got a lot of usage and it got a lot of press because it was tackling. It wasn't one of these things in a room that's fun. It was, it was solving a, a, a health problem that like anyone can sort of wrap their hands right. around. And so even when you're talking about getting volunteers excited about stuff, part of it was like seeing that your stuff's working and like yeah. you're using it. Yeah. Um, and so those big kind of, you know, those food problems are, are big ones. Yeah, and right. oftentimes in the world, like in the world of volunteerism, you get paid uh, by, uh, <coughs> mostly by, by getting praise, right? Like that's like the payoff if you're doing something for free. You want to, like, that, that is like one of the reasons that I do stuff is it's cool to see people use your stuff and actually like, have it be useful, right? And I mean, that is a great time. The other side effect of that, the flu shot app, was um, Raeem Mansour, who started out as a volunteer at the time for Chicago Department of Public Health, he's now an employee. He, the health department has sort of died, dove into civic hacking headfirst, and um, in late November, they got invited to sort of a national conference of public health officials and gave a presentation on all the things that the Chicago Health Department has done with civic hacking, both the Flu Shut app and Foodborne Chicago, and all the different things that they're doing using technology to advance public health in the city. So it not only had an immediate effect with the Flu Shut app, but the entire department has moved this direction and is now teaching other public health departments how it's done. I think uh, getting back to the issue of what should you care about, I think it has a lot to do with just hearing from more people, right? And, and maybe trying to get a wider variety of people coming in and giving presentations. Because mm -hmm. um, I think the more opinions you hear, probably the better informed you're just going to be. And, you know, I don't want to ever have to be like, who should care about this? <laughs> that, I mean, what do I mean? Uh, so, uh, all right, well, cool. We have some good ideas for workshops. Uh, this is a link for that hack dash. Uh, site. Right here? I don't know. I just missed it. If you go to smartchicogcollaborative.org, all the slides. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tweet this slide out too. That's good. Um, so, the, uh, so use this and see if it's helpful. Like, I actually want to hear you guys' opinion if, you, if it's good or not. I, I threw up a project on there. Um, yeah.
but I just wanted to add that uh, I think it would be great if you guys could like maybe post that you guys have some sort of um, you know government officials coming and just not necessarily saying that hey make this for me, but explaining their own curiosities about the open data that's publicly available. And to get back to what you asked earlier about what other types of kind of lessons perhaps you guys could benefit from something like data manager. For example, you know, there's this data available in this format. How can I, you know, turn it into JSON and display it in a Google chart or yeah, how can data I wrangling? Yeah. Right. That's yeah, yeah, oftentimes when you say, okay, I have I got my data, I got my project idea, let's go build it. And then like three days later, you're still trying to get the data in the right format, and you haven't even touched anything real on this. A lot of projects I've found are data lunging. Um, and there's some tools for that, actually. There's tools like uh, uh, OpenRefine is a really good tool for that. Um, we got a, a workshop on that stuff, too. That's actually cool. I think that could be coming from the architecture, but analytics seems like something that's got different kinds of data. How do you make sense of them? Mm -hmm. New data that you from them. Right. Yeah. Data mining. Or yeah. Sort of yeah. Absolutely. I mean, some of that stuff, like, you gotta be, you gotta be careful. Like, some of that stuff's complicated, right? So we gotta figure out, like, is there some low level stuff that, like, you know, we could cover in like an hour? Um, but yeah, that's. I mean, that's certainly something that um, we, yeah, we don't, we don't plan to do that kind of stuff. Was Was the IDES data just too hard for people? I mean, that IDES. Yeah, that's data that everybody likes. I mean, has. Sort of oh, use for it, okay. so you're talking about when Gideon came yeah. and talked about that? Yeah, I guess nothing came nothing. out of that. Is, uh, as far as I know. Yeah, nothing came. Like I have very mixed feelings because I used to work for an EES. Um, I, I think part of the problem with that particular data set is they didn't have it in a format we could grab easily. They had it on the website, but it was right. static. And they would only publish things like every quarter or sometimes every month. Um, and so unless you built like a scraper to get all that, um, it was harder to work with than sort of the other oceans of data that we can play around with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to work with that, so tell me about it. I personally, and this is the part where I get in trouble because I used to be a state employee and I know how to where all the so folks are. Right um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Like, I would personally like to see um, claims by community area per week so that when you're looking at the city, you can see areas growing redder as more applications. For example, if, God forbid, you started having massive layoffs at United and all the areas that United employees work in suddenly start getting a bunch of layoff claims in that particular neighborhood. Well, when you do studies, you know that you have <coughs> layoffs, and six months later, you start having foreclosure start. Right. And then once the foreclosures happen, then the whole neighborhood goes to hell because of all the social economic problems that are related to foreclosure. If you catch it when the neighborhood first starts seeing a spike in unemployment claims, and just start dumping resources at that point and prevent the foreclosures and the other economic hardships that are a result of long-term unemployment, then you've prevented a problem before it grows into something way worse. But the state doesn't have that data. It has the same data that has to report to the Department of Labor that gets you the uh, weekly unemployment, or the monthly unemployment numbers that you see in the news every month. Right. Well, and so I mean, that's a good example of, of sometimes just how how hard it is to actually. You could put someone in a room and say, "Hey, I've got data, and I want help from you guys," but they maybe don't have the right data, don't know how to get the right data to you. I mean, it's that's why it's it's hard, right? And it honestly, it takes tremendous effort from people inside government to even do this work of releasing data in the first place, right? I mean, there are people who have been hired to do exactly just that, right? And it is a full-time job, right? So it's something to appreciate as this group, right? But also, uh, we can offer help and guidance as far as what's the demand, right? What, what, what do we want to see, right? And or here's a good way, here's a good format for this data to come out. And I think that that does talk to this last point, which is, the more interactions we have with people in government and make them aware of what's possible, oftentimes, like, 
it's crazy when you just sort of say, like, yeah, that thing, I, I, when you bought a thing that's like Wikipedia, except you're paying for it. Like some, like, like I saw some, like some state website was like, they bought a Wikipedia. I'm like, you know, that's free. There's a thing called a Wikipedia, <laughs> and you can like download it. It's free, right? And like, there's just a lot of not like, like lack of technical knowledge and understanding by a lot of people in government. And this is something that's something that this group over and over again I've seen be as, as a, a tool that sort of a, a group that can help explain that and, and sort of come to the same level and talk the same. Level. And, and I think that's. Yeah, and one thing quickly adding, we had this conversation about the city before, is that um, it was a big lift just to get out the amount of data that Brett got put out there. Yeah. And there's this whole promise to politicians that we're going to put the data out and then apps are going to start like growing off of trees and like all these different things are going to start happening. And so I think, but well, one of the things that happens inside of government, when you start seeing apps come, applications come out, whether they're lightweight or whether they're healthcare or whatever, um, people in government start talking to each other, they start seeing the value of the applications. And then more data starts getting released. And they realize that wasn't as scary as they may have thought it was. So maybe it starts with geospatial stuff. That's here are trees and here are things. And that's not scary. And now here's some obvious data. Here's now here's some data. And so I think there's a baby step again. And I think before we can ask for more and more and more data, I've had a great conversation with Brett once where I was asking for something. It could have been a public guy. Yeah. So the, 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 the conversation was funny. He's like, hey, can I have this? And he's like, sure. You want me to stop working on automatic payment for the water billing instead? It's like, something's got to stop, right? Like, we're trying to credit card payments for water. You want an API for a plot, right? Like there are there are, there are two yeah. that have to happen because yeah. there are this many people sitting at this many desks. Yeah. You don't get more people, right. so that there there are going to have to be these, these trade-offs and showing the value of what this data can do outside the community. That's when people start seeing it inside City Hall, and then people start looking and saying like, "Hey, I heard those guys in the health department got something really cool. How can I have something?" Can you really build cool? the case. Well, you gotta you gotta you got you gotta put your data out too. Oh, right. That's yeah. Really cool. <laughs> and like magic things like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great perspective. It's like really hard to see, like past the wall of government. You don't know exactly what's going on, but that's I've seen that happen, and yeah, what Kevin described is, is really the case. And it's a uh, reason for us to keep doing what we're doing, right? So maybe that's a good thing to stop. Uh, I think we're that's it. The last slide is just sort of open-ended. Uh, I think you know we already covered a few things, but before we go, does anybody have any final? Comments or questions or things they'd like to point out? Uh, sure, I have two questions. First question, out of the apps that you guys have made, what's the most popular one? What kind of metrics do you guys get as far as visitors? I imagine you know, in the summertime, not many people are interested in snowplow traffic. And the second question is, you said you provide free hosting. Now, in what you know framework? Can I so, give you an ASP.net yes, web page? Yeah, you guys yes. uh, uh, so Smart Chicago has an Amazon hosting a Heroku uh, instance, and we um, have Scott Robin as our DevOps, or who sort of runs all that and makes sure that you know you're getting just the right size and not paying for a gargantuan monster server and you just need a little baby one. Um, if you go to smartchicagocollaborative.org, under projects there's a web hosting. You fill out a form. You say you know here I am. Here's how to get a hold of me. Here's my app. Here's what it does. As long as it is, it, is it a civic app that's for sh the city of Chicago, well, we will host it, no charge to you. Because we figure if you're making something for the city or for the residents of the people of Chicago or the people of Illinois, it shouldn't come out of your pocket. We're the as part of the Chicago Community Trust. That's one of the things that, that the trust is for is to provide infrastructure and support for all these different activities. So you fill out the form, Scott emails you, we get it hooked up, and we get rolled. To answer your uh, first question about uh, traffic, it varies uh, depending on the app and the time of year, like you said. Right? Like Clear Street Slowdown is quite popular. We got about you know, 3,000 hits in the last uh, week or so. Uh, and I'd say you know, during the enrollment period for CPS, we have another app called CPS Tears. And that just like skyrockets and you get you know, like five to eight thousand pages and you know. Cool. Um, so. One more quick one. Um, you mentioned that you have a Google developer license or something along those lines. Yeah. So can you um, potentially create like a web page that utilizes Google Maps or whichever version of the API there? 
because usually you're limited to only kind of like 10,000 hits per month or something. We like have that. a Smart Chicago has a Google business license. Right. Yeah. So when you, when you go to the opengovhacknight.org site to the infrastructure, all the different things are there, and I link you to the form. You fill out the form, and then Scott um, reaches out to you and sets everything up. Okay. Uh, serious question. Take it back and off here. Um, I know who you are. I own that you are. What's the URL? Uh, I know who you are. Okay. No website release, but who you are is going to be big. You have a Google business license. Does that mean you guys run Chromium, the um, Google Dart virtual machine that doesn't have to convert to JavaScript? I do not know. That's going to be a scout of a question. Uh, that's you stepped beyond my technical expertise. Oh. Um, that's something to ask. So I look into that. Yeah, yeah. You just fill out, if you go to the site and fill out the form, Scott will know. Oh. Uh, we primarily use that. Um, actually, Alex just just used the business license to do something with the Divi stuff. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, yeah. Did, uh, actually, Dick did all the hard work. Uh, uh -huh. He used it to scrape 90,000 pairs of distances, the distances between every one of the 300 Divi stations. Both ways, because um, as Lynn pointed out, wow, one some bike lanes. lanes go, yeah, one way. So, yeah, that was the first kind of uh, way that we put it to use was to create an enormous CSV with some very specific information. So, if you ever need to know the distance between, you know, this Divi station and yeah. the one near your house, call me or Nick. Have you guys solved the traveling Divi situation <laughs> right. yet? Like, how can I visit all Divi stations? Some like, things are not unroutable map. according to Google Maps. <laughs> we, we gave okay. it two Divi stations and sometimes it's <laughs> unroutable. So like, like, okay. While we're on resources, um, we're about to get text to Zen, which is a text survey tool. Um, nonprofit, if you're a nonprofit or a government department um, and are interested in doing uh, surveys by SMS, we will we'll work on it. Come see me. Um, are there any other resources that, as a developer or a designer or just someone who's interested in doing stuff, are there any resources that you wish you have but you don't have access to? Physical space. Physical space. For people, <laughs> physical space for people who meet up at more often than just Tuesday night. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We should work on that. <laughs> right other spaces actually. Um, what other like resources that you wish you had that you don't? Shopping list time. It's Christmas. <laughs> Okay, I have a, a good question. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> so, what are you thinking about the future of 2013? And, uh, and we have increasingly more data. And I've seen some apps that they try to make use of all this data, and sometimes they offer like 15 visualizations and five or six types of charts. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I wonder what is the challenge now that we are having much more data? And they have to kind of streamline and just answer a basic question that the user wants. So I don't, I don't know. I just want to hear your, your opinion about that. On how to do good design? <laughs> yeah, well, because <laughs> I think the temptation now, oh, we have data for this and we have data for that. Then maybe yeah. more data is not exactly what is needed. Well, I mean, but sometimes so, it is, right? Uh, I mean, Josh said it really well, is that uh, it's the question that should drive what you think, not I have this data, right? Oftentimes you'll spend like hours and hours and days and days working on one particular data set, and then it turns out that the only thing you really care about all that analysis is like one number, right? And that just because you put all that work in doesn't mean you show it all on the home page, right? You could show it in the code and if someone really wants to see it, right? But how did we really you know, do this? Right? But like right, yeah. you know, off like and that's that's information design, right? Yeah. That, yeah. I have to yes, talk about you later. Okay, right. I mean, oh, right. This is a personal question. I see you. I see where you are. Right now. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it's it's hard, right? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have really. That's why I think you really need to think about the question one answer. Talk to the people who you think would use it, right? Really go at it from from that angle, right? Nope. As opposed to I can do this, right? Because yeah, you can do anything. Um, all right, I think we've taken up enough of everyone's time. Um, so that's. That's the year review. Yay. Uh,
Okay. Uh, yeah, we can do that. Uh, we all leave the room. Uh, we'll put up on the board things that uh, the groups are interested in working on a different project. Why don't we have dash? No, let's just do it. Um, so, uh, is anybody interested in Civic Hacking 101? We kind of went over a lot already, but hey, people are still interested. I will do it. You thought you could I'm curious about how to parse data. Okay. Okay. Should we write it down? Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Oh, I'll pause it. So, uh, Open Gov 101, Christopher, give your spiel. So, Civic Hacking 101 is sort of a 15 minute orientation. I go over kind of the origin story of Open Data in Chicago. Uh, talk a little bit about GitHub and open source and what it is and why we do it. Um, I talk about the community organizing aspect of the work. It's not all about coding. And then um, I show some examples of different projects uh, and how to get involved in a project and that not knowing how to code is perfectly okay. Uh, I usually do that. So if you walk up this hallway and look this way, there are some couches. We're over there. And you do it? Uh, immediately following the when we break. Do you go through right now? Well, not right now. When we once we get all the projects up, we'll sort of say ready, break, and everybody will scatter, and I will scatter. Oh, you mean today? Okay. So I'm working on. Is it up? There we go. Uh, this is a project I'll be working oh, on. I think Scott. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You censored it. Yeah, I bought both domains, I'm sorry. But I think, I think so um, this is a, sort of a early version of a website. Uh, it goes and checks the uh, Metropolitan, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District website, which has information about whether or not they are actively pumping raw sewage into the Chicago River, which happens way more often than you think. Uh, so it says, it says no right now. So, all right. But sometimes it says yes. Uh, and so the idea is uh, to add more to this, right? They're um, just talking about making some historical data, which I think yeah, is Yeah, so we're, we actually uh, scraped the site in order to get historical data. So I'm kind of curious now to look at it like geographically and over time to see like maybe historically what's happening after rain events or like where in the city. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested, I will be out. Yeah, we'll be working on Other projects, people? Yeah. So I yeah. volunteer to offer, you know, I have experience with Git and with Python and scraping and data parsing. Um, I'm going to be going to the Civic Hacking 101 because I haven't done this yet, but okay. um, during it or after it, I want to interrupt. Do you want to talk about Git or do you want to talk about data parsing? Yes, you do, right? I can help. So, yes. Okay. 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 Cool. Uh, I also, I'm going to people who said who need a physical space. Uh, I've been working at a space uh, uh, in Pilsen, and a lot of other people who have been to different hackathons, they are meeting there as well, so I can talk about the space. No. Is that the SSH space? It's, it's at Blue 1647. Oh. Formerly known as Google, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, a lot of people who are at the was the the, the last hackathon, the back where the Groupon was. Okay. I think the one somebody mentioned here. So. Uh, yeah, the hackathon. There was a question earlier about CPS and teaching kids. Nick, you had a thing last week about. Talking about that, do you want to talk about that? Uh, I was just curious whether anyone's heard about, like, I know Chicago Public Schools is planning to add computer science courses in all high schools across the city, and some past year, over the next few years, or maybe five years, I can remember different things. Does anyone have any new information? Is that not what you're talking about today? No, they, I just they, they announced that Monday. Okay. There, there were also this last week. I don't know how you missed it, but there was a thing called uh, called Hour of Code, and uh, Hour of Code is on code.org, and there were 16, 16 million uh, people who did an hour of coding in this little language called Blockly. And uh, yeah, if you look up Hour of Code. You'll find a you'll find a set of uh, things that students can do coding, and and they can do it with they can normally do the projects within an hour, 
if they sort of know what coding is, they can do it in about 10 minutes. Okay. Cool. Uh, are there projects? Um, I uh, have a desire on a project. I'm on the south side of Chicago. I, I travel a long way to get here. That's why um, we have our nonprofit on the south side. But enough about that. If anybody knows any projects on the south side or know any people on the south side organizing, um, or Python, or anything like web. Anything else? Uh, all right then. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you to ThoughtWorks for paying for the food this week. Did you know? Uh, awesome. Well, uh, we are not going to have. Uh, any more access for the rest of the year due to holidays. So the next one will be in January. So do not come back here this month, please. Uh, we won't be here. Or can I just, just want to? I just want to uh, thank you. Yeah. You guys are awesome. Good night, America. <laughs> 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 <laughs>